Welcome to the Sleep Charming Podcast, the podcast where I help you drift off for a good night's sleep or simply take a moment to relax. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a review or a rating. So sit back, take a deep breath, and let me read you an old story. Geology deals with the rocks of the Earth's crust. It learns from their composition and structure how the rocks were made and how they've been modified. It ascertains how they've been brought to their present places and wrought to their various topographic forms, such as hills and valleys, plains and mountains. It studies the vestiges which rocks preserve of ancient organisms which once inhabited our planet. Geology is the history of Earth and its inhabitants, as read in the rocks of the Earth's crust. To obtain a general idea of the nature and method of our science before beginning its study in detail, we may visit some valley, such as that illustrated in the frontispiece, or whose sides are rocky ledges. Here the rocks lie in horizontal layers. Although only their edges are exposed, we may infer that these layers run into the upland on either side and underlie the entire district. They are part of the foundation of solid rock, which everywhere is found beneath the loose materials of the surface. The edges of the valley of our illustration are of sandstone. Looking closely at the rock, we see that it's composed of myriads of grains of sand, cemented together. These grains have been worn and rounded. They are sorted also, those of each layer being about of a size. By some means, they have been brought hither from some more ancient source. Surely these grains have had a history before they here found a resting place, a history which we are to learn to read. The successive layers of the rock suggest that they were built one after another, from the bottom upwards. We may be assured that each layer was formed before those above it, as that the bottom courses of stone in a wall were laid before the courses which rest upon them. We have no reason to believe that the lowest layers, which we see here, were the earliest ever formed. Indeed, some deep boring in the vicinity may prove that the ledges rest upon the layers of rock which extended downwards for many hundreds of feet below the valley floor. Nor may we conclude that the highest levels, here, were the latest ever laid. For elsewhere, we may find still layers lying upon them. A short search may find in the rock relics of animals, such as the imprints of shells which lived when it was deposited, and as these are of kinds whose nearest living relatives now have their home in the sea, we infer that it was on the flat sea floor that the sandstone was laid. Its present position, hundreds of feet above sea level, proves that it has since emerged to form part of the land, while the flatness of the beds show that the movement was so uniform and gentle as to not break or strongly bend them from their original attitude. The surface of some of these layers is ripple-marked. Hence, the sand must once have been as loose as that of shallow sea bottoms and sea beaches today, which is thrown into similar ripples by movements of the water. In some way, the grains have since become cemented into firm rock. Note that the layers on one side of the valley agree with those on the other, each matching the one opposite at the same level. Once they were continuous across the valley, where the valley now is was once a continuous upland built of horizontal layers. The layers now show their edges or outcrop on the valley sides because they have been cut out by the valley trench. The rock of the ledges is crumbling away. At the foot of each step of rock lie fragments which have fallen. Thus, the valley is slowly widening. It has been narrower in the past, it will be wider in the future. Through the valley runs a stream. The waters of rains which have fallen on the upper parts of the stream's basin are now on their way down to the river 
and the sea. Rock fragments and grains of sand creeping down the valley slopes come within reach of the streams and are washed along by the running water. Here and there, they lodge for a time in banks of sand and gravel. But sooner or later, they are taken up again and carried on. The grains of sand which were brought from some ancient source to form these rocks are on their way to some new goal. As they are washed along the rocky bed of the stream, they slowly rasp and wear it deeper. The valley will be deeper in the future. It has been less deep in the past. In this little valley, we see slow changes now in progress. We find also in the composition, the structure, and the attitude of the rocks, and the landforms to which they have been sculptured, the record of a long succession of past changes involving the origin of sand grains and their gathering and deposit upon the bottom of some ancient sea the cementation of their layers into solid rock, the uplift of the rocks to form a land surface, and last of all, the carving of a valley in the upland. Everywhere, in the fields, along the river, among the mountains, by the seashore, and in the desert, we may discover slow changes now in progress, and the record of similar changes in the past. Everywhere we may catch glimpses of a process of gradual change, which stretches backwards into the past and forwards into the future, by which the forms and structures of the face of the earth are continually built and continually destroyed. The science which deals with this long process is geology. Geology treats of the natural changes now taking place upon the earth and within it, the agencies which produce them, and the landforms and rock structures which result. It studies the changes of the present in order to be able to read the history of the earth's changes in the past. The various agencies which have fashioned the faces of the earth may be divided into two general classes. In part one, we shall consider those which work upon the earth from without, such as the weather, running water, glaciers, the wind, and the sea. In part two, we shall treat of those agencies whose sources are within the earth, and among whose manifestations are volcanoes and earthquakes, and the various movements of the Earth's crust. As we study each agency, we shall notice not only how it does its work, but also the record which it leaves in the rock structures and the landforms which it produces. With this preparation, we shall be able in part three to read in the records of the rocks the history of our planet and the successive forms of life which have dwelt upon it. Part 1. External Geological Agencies The Work of the Weather In our excursion to the valley with sandstone ledges, we witnessed a process which is going forward in all lands. Everywhere the rocks are crumbling away. Their fragments are creeping down the hillsides to the streamways and are carried by the streams to the sea, where they are rebuilt into rocky layers. When again the rocks are lifted to form land, the process will begin anew. Again they will crumble and creep down the slopes and be washed by streams to the sea. Let us begin our study of this long cycle of change at the point where rocks disintegrate and decay under the action of the weather. In studying now a few outcrops and quarries, we shall learn a little of some common rocks and how they weather away. Stratification and jointing. At the sandstone ledges, we saw that the rock was divided into parallel layers. The thicker layers are known as strata, and the thin leaves into which each stratum may sometimes be split are termed laminae. 
to a greater or less degree, these layers differ from each other in fineness of grain, showing that the material has been sorted. The planes which divide them are called bedding planes. Beside the bedding planes, there are other division planes, which cut out the strata from top to bottom. These are found in all rocks and are known as joints. Two sets of joints, running at about right angles to each other, together with the bedding planes, divide the sandstone into quadrangular blocks. Sandstone. Examining a piece of sandstone, we find it composed of grains quite like those of river sand or of sea beaches. Most of the grains are of a clear glassy mineral called quartz. These quartz grains are very hard and will scratch the steel of a knife blade. They are not affected by acid and their broken surfaces are irregular like those of broken glass. The grains of sandstone are held together by some cement. This may be calcareous, consisting of soluble carbonate of lime. In brown sandstones, the cement is commonly ferruginous, hydrated iron oxide or iron rust, forming the bond somewhat in the case of iron nails, which have been rusted together. The strongest and most lasting cement is silicious and sand rocks whose grains are closely cemented by silicia, the chemical substance of which quartz is made, are known as quartzites. We are now prepared to understand how sandstone is affected by the action of the weather. On ledges where the rock is exposed to view, its surface is more or less discoloured, and the grains are loose and may be rubbed off with a finger. On gentle slopes, the rock is covered with a soil composed of sand, which evidently is crumbled sandstone, and dark carbonaceous matter derived from the decay of vegetation. Clearly it is by the dissolving of the cement that the rock thus breaks down to loose sand. A piece of sandstone with calcareous cement, or a bit of old mortar, which is really an artificial stone also made of sand cemented by lime, may be treated in a test tube with hydrochloric acid to illustrate the process. A limestone quarry. Here also we find the rock stratified and jointed. On the quarry face, the rock is distinctly seen to be altered for some distance from its upper surface. Below the altered zone, the rock is sound and is quarried for building but the altered upper layers are too soft and broken to be used for this purpose. If the limestone is laminated, the lamini here have split apart, although below they hold fast together. Near the surface, the stone has become rotten and it crumbles at the touch, while on the top it has completely broken down to a thin layer of limestone meal, on which rests a fine reddish clay. Limestone is made of minute grains of carbonate of lime or firmly held together by calcareous cement. A piece of the stone placed in a test tube with hydrochloric acid dissolves with a brisk effervescence, leaving insoluble impurities, which were disseminated through it at the bottom of the tube as a little clay. We can now understand the changes in the upper layers of the quarry. At the surface of the rock, the limestone has completely dissolved, leaving the insoluble residue as a layer of reddish clay. Immediately below the clay, the rock has disintegrated into meal, where the cement between the limestone grains has been removed. While beneath this, the laminae are split apart where the cement has been dissolved, where the stone is more porous. As these changes in the rock are greatest at the surface and diminish downwards, we infer that they have been caused by agents working downward from the surface. At certain points these agencies have been more effective than elsewhere. The upper rock surface is pitted. Joints are widened as they approach the surface, and along the seams we may find that the rock has altered even down to the quarry floor. A shale pit. Let us now visit some pit where shale, 
a laminated and somewhat hardened clay, is quarried for the manufacture of brick. The laminae of this fine-grained rock may be as thin as cardboard in places, and close joints may break the rock into small rhombic blocks. On the upper surface, we note that the shale has weathered to a clayey soil in which all traces of structure have been destroyed. The clay and the upper layers of the shale beneath it are reddish or yellow, while in many cases, the colour of the unaltered rock beneath is blue. The sedimentary rocks. The three kinds of layered rocks whose acquaintance we have made, sandstone, limestone and shale, are the leading types of the great group of stratified or sedimentary rocks. This group includes all rocks made of sediments, their materials having settled either in water upon the bottom of rivers, lakes or seas, or on dry land as in the case of deposits made by the wind and by glaciers. Sedimentary rocks are divided into fragmental rocks, which are made of fragments, either coarse or fine, and the far less common rocks which are constituted of chemical precipitates. The sedimentary rocks are divided according to their composition into the following classes. 1. The arenaceous or quartz rocks, including beds of loose sand and gravel, sandstone, quartzite, and conglomerate, a rock made of cemented round gravel or pebbles. 2. The calcareous, or lime rocks, including limestone and a soft white rock formed of calcareous powder, known as chalk. 3. The argillaceous, or clay rocks, including muds, clays, and shales. These three classes pass by mixture into one another. Thus, there are limey and clayey sandstones, sandy and clayey limestones, and sandy and limey shales. Granite. This familiar rock may be studied as an example of the second great group of rocks, the unstratified or igneous rocks. These are not made of cemented sedimentary grains, but of interlocking crystals which have crystallised from a molten mass. Examining a piece of granite, the most conspicuous crystal which meet the eye are those of feldspar. They are commonly pink, white or yellow and break along smooth cleavage planes which reflect the light like tiny panes of glass. Mica may be recognised by its glittering plates which split into thin elastic scales. A third mineral, harder than steel, breaking along irregular surfaces like broken glass, we identify as quartz. How granite alters under the action of the weather may be seen in outcrops where it forms the bedrock or country rock. Underlying the loose formations of the surface, and in many parts of the northern states where granite boulders and pebbles more or less decay, may be found in a surface sheet of stony clay called the drift. Of the different minerals composing granite, quartz alone remains unaltered. Mica weathers to detach flakes which have lost their elasticity. The feldspar crystals have lost their luster and hardness, and even have decayed to clay. Where long, weathered granite forms the country rock, it often may be cut with spade or trowel for several feet from the surface. So rotten is the feldspar, and here the rock is seen to break down into clayey soil containing grains of quartz and flakes of mica. These are a few simple illustrations of the surface changes which some of the common kinds of rock undergo. The agencies by which these changes are brought about we will now take up under two divisions. Chemical agencies producing rock decay and mechanical agencies producing rock disintegration. The chemical work of water. As water falls on the earth in rain, it has already absorbed from the air carbon dioxide, carbonic acid gas, and oxygen. 
as it sinks into the ground and becomes what is termed ground water. It takes into solution from the soil humus acids and carbon dioxide, both of which are constantly being generated there by the decay of organic matter. So both rain and groundwater are charged with active chemical agents, by the help of which they corrode and rust and decompose all rocks to a greater or less degree. We notice now three of the chemical processes concerned in weathering. Solution, the formation of carbonates, and oxidation. Solution. Limestone, although so little affected by pure water, that 5,000 gallons would be needed to dissolve a single pound, is easily dissolved in water charged with carbon dioxide. In limestone regions, on boiling the water for some time, the carbon dioxide gas is expelled. The whole of the limestone carbonate can no longer be held in solution, and much of it is thrown down to form a crust or scale in the kettle or in the tubes of the steam boiler. All waters which throw over limestone rocks or soak through them are constantly engaged in dissolving them away and in the curse of time destroy beds of vast extent and great thickness. The upper surface of limestone rocks becomes deeply pitted, as we saw in the limestone quarry, and where the mantle of waste has been removed, it may be found so intricately furrowed that it is difficult to traverse. Beds of rock salt buried among the strata are dissolved by seeping water, which issues in salt springs. Gypsum, a mineral composed of hydrated sulphate of lime, and so soft that it may be scratched with a fingernail, is readily taken up by water, giving to the water of wells and springs a peculiar hardness difficult to remove. The dissolving action of moisture may be noted on marble tombstones of some age, marble being a limestone altered by heat and pressure and composed of crystalline grains. By assuming that the date on each monument marks the year of its erection, one may estimate how many years on the average it has taken for weathering to loosen fine grains on the polished surface, so that they may be rubbed off with the finger to destroy the polish, to round the sharp edges of tool marks in the lettering, and at last to open cracks and seams and break down the stone. We may notice also whether the gravestones weather more rapidly on the sunny or the shady side, and on the sides or on the top. The weathered surface of granular limestone containing shells shows them standing in relief. As the shells are made of crystalline carbonate of lime, we may infer whether the carbonate of lime is less soluble in its granular or in its crystalline condition. The formation of carbonates. In attacking minerals, water does more than merely take them into solution. It decomposes them, forming a new chemical compound, of which the carbonates are among the most important. Thus, feldspar consists of the insoluble silicate of alumina, together with certain alkaline silicates, which are broken up by the action of water containing carbon dioxide forming alkaline carbonates. These carbonates are freely soluble and contribute potash and soda to soils and river waters. By the removal of the soluble ingredients of feldspar, there is left the silicate of alumina, united with water or hydrated, in the condition of a fine plastic clay, which, when white and pure, is known as kaolin, and is used in the manufacture of porcelain. Feldspatic rocks which contain no iron compounds thus weather to whitish crusts, and even apparently sound crystals of feldspar, when ground to thin slices and placed under the microscope, may be seen to be milky in colour throughout because an internal change to kaolin has begun. Oxidation Rocks containing compounds of iron weather to reddish crusts, and the seams of these rocks are often lined with rusty films. 
oxygen and water have here united with the iron, forming hydrated iron oxide. The effects of oxidation may be seen in the alteration of many kinds of rocks and in red and yellow colours of soil and subsoils. Pyrite is a very hard mineral of a pale brass colour, found in scattered crystals in many rocks, and is composed of iron and sulphur, iron sulphide. Under the attack of the weather it takes upon oxygen, forming iron sulphate, green vitriol, a soluble compound, and insoluble hydrated iron oxide, which as a mineral is known as limonite, several large masses of iron sulphide were placed some years ago on the lawn in front of the National Museum at Washington. The mineral changed so rapidly to green vitriol that enough of its poisonous compound was washed into the ground to kill the roots of the surrounding grass. Agents of Mechanical Disintegration Heat and Cold Rocks exposed to the direct rays of the sun become strongly heated by day and expand. After sunset, they rapidly cool and contract. When the difference in temperature between day and night is considerable, the repeated strains of sudden expansion and contraction at last become greater than the rocks can bear, and they break, for the same reason that a glass cracks when plunged into boiling water. Rocks are poor conductors of heat, and hence their surfaces may become painfully hot under the full blaze of the sun, while the interior remains comparatively cool. By day, the surface shell expands and tends to break loose from the mass of the stone. In cooling in the evening, the surface shell suddenly contracts on the unyielding interior and in time is forced off the scales. Many rocks, such as granite, are made up of grains of various minerals which differ in colour and in their capacity to absorb heat, and which therefore contract and expand in different ratios. In heating and cooling, these grains crowd against their neighbours and tear loose from them, so that finally the rock disintegrates into sand. The conditions for the destructive action of heat and cold are most fully met in arid regions where vegetation is wanting for lack of sufficient rain. The soil not being held together by the roots of plants is blown away over large areas, leaving the rocks bare to the blazing sun in a cloudless sky. The air is dry and the heat received by the earth by day is therefore rapidly radiated at night into space. There is a sharp and sudden fall of temperature after sunset, and the rocks, strongly heated by day, are now chilled perhaps even to the freezing point. In the Sahara, the thermometer has been known to fall 131 degrees Fahrenheit within a few hours. In the light air of the Pamir Plateau in Central Asia, a rise of 90 degrees Fahrenheit has been recorded from 7 o'clock in the morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon. On the mountains of southwestern Texas, there are frequently heard crackling noises as the rocks of that arid region throw off scales from a fraction of an inch to four inches in thickness, and loud reports are made as huge boulders split apart. Desert pebbles, weakened by long exposure to heat and cold, have been shivered to fine sharp pointed fragments and being placed in sand heated to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Beds half a foot thick, forming the floor of limestone quarries in Wisconsin, have been known to buckle and arch and break to fragments under the heat of the summer sun. Frost. By this term is meant the freezing and thawing of water contained in the pores and crevices of rocks. All rocks are more or less porous, and all contain more or less water in their pores. Workers in stone call this quarry water, and speak of a stone as green before the quarry water has dried out. Water also seeps along joints and bedding planes and gathers in all seams and crevices. Water expands in freezing. 10 cubic inches of water freezing to about 11 cubic inches of ice. 
As water freezes in the rifts and pores of rocks, it expands with irresistible force, illustrated in the freezing and breaking of water pipes in winter. The first rift in the rock, perhaps too narrow to be seen, is widened little by little by the wedges of successive frosts. And finally, the rock is broken into detached blocks, and these into angular chipstone by the same process. It is on mountain tops and in high latitudes that the effects of frost are most plainly seen. Every summit, says Wemper, amongst the rock summits which I have stood, has been nothing but a piled up heap of fragments. In Iceland and Spitsberger in Kamchatka and in other frigid lands, large areas are thickly strewn with sharp edged fragments into which the rock has been shattered by frost. Thank you.